Those of you that have been coming the last several weeks, you know that we have been teaching a series that kind of had its origin in an object lesson that I received over 20 years ago um, as, a, as a young pastor. And this object lesson, I'm going to tell it to you guys tonight for the last time, so those of you that haven't heard it, and you this hear it. everybody else has heard it like 10 times. Bear with me, okay? So this lesson that I learned came in a classroom, and the presenter had uh, uh, something that he was trying to give us a mental picture that we would always remember, and it really worked for me personally. He had a glass vase like this in front of us, and he put it on a table, and on the table he had several different elements. He had, he had some small stones, he had some sand, he had some water, and then he had some big stones. He had these large stones down at the end. And he started by telling us that these elements represented our time and the contents of our life. And he told us that in order for us to be effective in ministry, we were going to have to make, make decisions about what were the most important things in our life as pastors. The roles that we were going to be playing in people's lives were going to be very diverse and a lot of things were going to be asked of us. And if we didn't make the right decisions, we weren't going to be effective. And so the way he illustrated this is he took the small stones and he filled this, this vase up first and he said, these small stones represent all of the busy things of your day, all of the emails, the phone calls. You gotta run an errand, you gotta change a light bulb, you gotta get the oil changed, all these different things. He put all those things first and it filled up the vase to here. Then he took the sand and he poured it in and he said, these are all the things that, they're, they're urgent. People are in need and they're screaming for your attention and they're right now, they have to happen and you're just constantly putting out fires and he filled it up, the sand filled all the way up to here. And then he gets to the end of the table and there's these big stones. And he says, now these big stones represent the most important things in your life. These, these big stones represent the roles that you know you have to play in the lives of people. And these are the big stones that you don't want to neglect. And so he takes these big stones and he tries to put them in this vase and there's no room for them. There's only like two that can fit and the other stones are laying on the table. And he's like, this is your life. The most important things are falling all over the place because there's no room for them. And so then he took everything out. He took the sand out. He took the little rocks out. And this time he took the big stones and he put them in first. And he said, now these are the most important things in your life. Put them in their place first. And then he took the small stones and put them in. He's like, here's all the busyness. Then he took the sand and he put it in and it started to fill in. And at the end, he still had room to pour a pitcher of water in too. And it filled everything in, and it still didn't even fill the whole glass vase up. And he, he showed us this illustration. He said, if you don't put the most important things of your life at the top of the list of the priorities of what you truly want to be as a pastor, you'll never get them done, and you'll never be able to fulfill those rules. And so as I was thinking about that object lesson at the beginning of this year, I began to think about... The, the verse in scripture where Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above everything else. He says, if you seek the kingdom of God above all else and you live righteously, he's like, everything else will be given to you. In different translations, it says, seek the kingdom of God above all, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added to you. And it's this picture of, for me, the big stones of my walk with God, the big stones of my spirituality, the big stones of what are the most important things in my life as a Christian. So every week we've been talking about these stones, Jason's seven big stones. And so, so tonight I'm gonna get you to seven, number seven, the seven stone. But first we talked about devoting ourselves to the Lord. We've talked about gathering together with other believers. We've talked about giving generously. We've talked about serving. We've talked about enduring trials and testing without quitting. And then last week, we talked about the big rock number six, forgiveness. Last week, we, taught, we started our time with a scripture where Peter asked Jesus a really, really important and interesting question. He, he asked Jesus the question, 
How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? He says, Jesus, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Jesus answered his question by telling a story. And in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus begins to unfold this parable of a man who went before his debtor and this debtor had asked him to pay this debt that equaled millions of dollars and the guy couldn't do it. And he begged for mercy, begged for forgiveness, and the debtor let him go and the debtor wiped his slate clean. And then in the story, the man who had been forgiven of these millions of dollars walks out and he finds a friend who owes him a thousand dollars. And rather than being the, the, the one who understands forgiveness at a big level and is able to continue that spirit of forgiveness at a small level, the man completely forgets what he has just received. And he looks at the man who owes him a thousand bucks and he grabs him by the throat and he says, give me my money now. And the man that owed him a thousand bucks says the same exact words to him that he said to the other guy that he owed millions to. He says, have mercy on me. Give me more time and I'll pay you. But this man who had been forgiven of millions looked at this man who had been forgiven, owed him thousands and said, I'm not giving you any more time. As a matter of fact, I want my money now. I'm going to have you thrown in jail because of what you owe me. And in this parable, Jesus gets to the end of the story and he talks about how this man who had been forgiven of millions ends up having to go before this debtor again. And the debtor looks at him and says, didn't you receive forgiveness that equaled millions of dollars? How could you not take that to heart and pass it on to the next guy? And Jesus said, because you failed to offer the forgiveness that you had received, now you also will go to jail for the debt that you owe. And in this story, Jesus teaches us that when we refuse to forgive someone, we go to spiritual prison. It locks us up. It ends up ruining relationship and it keeps us in a place where we are truly bound because in the parable, Jesus is trying to convey this truth that when Peter was asking the question, how many times do I have to forgive someone? Jesus was saying, Peter, it's not about you. The question that you are asking is self-centered and self-focused. It's not how many times you have to forgive. Jesus says, the number is 70 times seven. It's perpetual, it's endless. You are to enter into an understanding that you have been given forgiveness. Therefore, Jesus is now giving us the ministry of releasing forgiveness into this dark world. Jesus says, you have been given something that is not yours to hold on to. It is to be a conduit through your life so that you can be the one that offers forgiveness on the daily. Remember, Jesus said these famous words. He said that when we pray, we're supposed to pray like this. He said, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Jesus said, pray like this, give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Every single day, Jesus says, pray these words, forgive us as we forgive those that sin against us. Why did Jesus say to pray this every single day? Because every single day, people are going to sin against you in some way. Every single day, you are going to be given a choice whether to offer the forgiveness that God has put inside of you to give or to hoard it to yourself and say, no, I'm gonna hold on to it and I will not forgive. See, everything that we're learning right now through scripture has everything to do with as God gives to us, 
we are supposed to keep it going and give away to others. Jesus said, forgive, forgive as Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Forgive as Christ Jesus has forgiven you. And so with that thinking tonight of being able to experience something for yourself and then to keep it going, tonight I want to give you Jason's seventh big stone, all right? The seventh big rock. Are you ready? It's to love intentionally. To love intentionally the people that you like and especially the ones that you don't. I want to start tonight by reading some of the letter from our brother named John. He was a man that we just got done last year reading through his entire gospel, his entire, his entire account of being the one that Jesus loved. This guy understood the love of God like very few authors in scripture have communicated. John was close to Jesus and John was also somebody who began to experience the love of God in a deep way and it began to change his writings. And in his letter, 1 John chapter four, he says these words, he says, God is love. And he says, all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. This concept that in order for me to love people that I don't like, everybody here has those people in their life that were just like, you know what? No. I do not like you. <laughs> Everybody in this room has those people. In order for us to begin to experience what this is teaching us, we have to get past the surface discrepancies in our personalities and in our mannerisms. I believe that there are people in this world that are put on this earth to be spiritual sandpaper in our lives. They're supposed to rub you they're supposed to give friction. Why? Because you've got rough edges to you, man, and they need to help get those things off. And sometimes the friction of relationships causes us, like we learned last week, to withhold forgiveness. Say, no, you have stepped on my toe and my feelings one too many times. I am not going to let you off the hook this time. And when we talk about the love of God, we take it to another level. See, in scripture, when it talks about love, not too long ago, we broke down this concept of the love that God gives and the love that God puts inside of us. This love that is called in the Greek language agape, where it's a God love that doesn't come from this earth. It's not like we love each other. The agape love of God has a completely different set of, of regulations, requirements, and grading to it. It has a completely different set of values to it. The agape love of God does not look at the recipients of its love and size them up based on anything they've ever done or not done. It doesn't look at the worth of the recipient and think whether or not they are worthy to receive this love. The agape love of God is blind to where it goes. It is one directional, it is not selfish. Do you know that most of the time when we say we love each other, there's a hook in it, like a fish hook. It's like that, it's like that pole with the hook on it. It's like, I love you, but once we get it around somebody, then we can uh, pull them to us. Because there's an ulterior motive to the way that we love each other a lot of times. It's not selfless. 
It's got a little bit of selfishness in it. I'm going to say I love you because if you tell me you love me back, oh, that makes me feel good. There's always a hook in human love, but not with God. It's one directional. It is not say, I will love you with the purpose that now you'll love me back. God doesn't need our love. God says, this agape love is what I promise to deposit inside of you. Now, the deposit is an interesting concept because when you receive a deposit on something, it's not the full thing. It's not like you get it all at the same time and you receive the deposit of the way that God works and the spirit of God inside of your life. But this deposit begins to grow and it begins to have its way in your life. And ultimately, God wants for your love to become like his love. What is God's love like? Well, John talks in here in this short little passage, and he uses this all through his letter. But I just pulled this short passage out because it, it, it talks about it so vividly. He uses this word perfect when he talks about God's love. He uses it over and over and over again. He says, God's perfect love expels all fear. He says, our love will grow more perfect like God's. He says, if we're afraid, it's because we have not fully experienced his perfect love. He's talking about God's love in a very vivid way. About five or six years ago, we went through a teaching series where we looked through, through the Bible at this very peculiar word that is found in scripture. And in the Greek language, this word, um, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but I think it's teleos. Um, but teleos is a word that we began to just like chase down in all of the variety of places that it's found in the Bible. And this word teleos, it has with it this, this picture of something that is complete or mature or fully developed. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't lack anything. This word, teleos, is the word that we find that describes God's perfect love. It's a teleos love. Remember that word, teleos, because this is the process that God is doing inside of every one of our hearts when we come into relationship with God through Christ. He begins the process of teleos. It's the process of maturing. It's the process of developing. It's the process of taking us to a place where ultimately we are fully developed, lacking nothing. And this is the word that John uses about God's love. He says God's perfect love, the teleos love, it's a mind blower because it is fully developed. It needs nothing added to it. Now that's much different than our love. Our love needs a lot of help. Our love needs some, you know, propping up. Our love has good days and bad days, but God's love is complete. And he said, this is the love that I've put inside of you. He also talks about this perfect love in such an interesting way, John uses these words about how God's perfect or teleos love expels fear. When God's perfect love comes into the room, fear has to leave the room. When God's perfect love shows up in relationship, the fear in that relationship has to leave. One of the things about humans that I've seen and I... I mean, it's like once your eyes are open to it, you see it everywhere, and it starts with myself, is I don't care how tough you act, I don't care how you put yourself together and you think I've got everything how I want it and I've got full control of my life, I don't care. Everybody is afraid of something. Everybody has fear in their life in some way. Now, a lot of us have learned how to navigate those fears. A lot of us have learned how to surrender our fears to God. And a lot of us are learning how to trust God when fear tries to overtake us. Many of the songs that we sing as anthems of praise have to do with the fact that God gives us victory over fear. Fear does not rule our lives any longer. But in the book of Hebrews, it actually talks about how human beings are, are born with a fear of dying. It's like this innate fear that every person has of what's gonna happen to me after I breathe my last breath. And it talks in Hebrews about how Jesus came 
and he became a human like us and died for us so that he once and for all could take away the sting of death and he could take away the keys from fear, hell, and the grave and he could make us no longer fearful of death. How Jesus has given us the ultimate remedy for fear. When John talks about how perfect love casts this fear out, he's talking about how it's a perfect love that has this effect. In Matthew chapter five, chapter five, verse 43, Jesus says, as he's talking to a crowd of people, he says, you have heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For God gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And God sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be teleos, perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, teleos. Jesus uses this, this picture of our Father in heaven. And he says, the love of the perfect love of God is displayed in this world in a very peculiar way. He says, I want you to think about God, the creator, the sovereign one, the one who answers to no one. And he looks at this dark world and he does not discriminate or pick and choose who gets the sunlight and who gets the rain. God looks down and says, I will grant my sunlight and my rain to everyone. I don't care if they deserve it or they don't deserve it. I don't care if they've had a good day or a bad day. I don't care if they've blasphemed me or if they worshiped me. God says, I don't care where they land in the spectrum of economics, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're conservative or liberal. I don't care about their politics. I don't care where they live or where they come from. I don't care. God says, I will reign on everyone the same way. And then Jesus says the craziest thing. He says, that is a picture of how God wants you to love others. Amen. That's the picture of your love being distributed. He says, God closes his eyes and he says, everybody gets the sun and everybody gets the rain. And he says, when you love in this way, you are acting like true children of God. This is a mind blower for us to think in terms of the way that God distributes his resources. And Jesus says, I want my love to flow through your life the same way that forgiveness does. I want my love to flow through your life to every person you come in contact with because it is not about you. It is not about how you feel about the person. It is not about whether or not you think they deserve your love or not. He says, when you think, you know what, I do not want to love that person, he says, look at your Father in heaven. Amen. Have you ever needed the rain and your buddy's getting poured on and you're like, where's mine? No. No. God pours it out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse, or 1 Corinthians 12 and, and, and 13, we see a letter that is written to the church. It's written to a letter of, written to Christians who are trying to figure this thing out of how do we get, to, get together and how do we live together and how do we worship together and how do we do church and how do we do life and all of these different things. 
God uses the Apostle Paul to bring instruction about many things. He's talking about spiritual gifts and he's talking about how God has given gifts to the church and how important these spiritual gifts are. And he's talking about how people have used these gifts in all manner of ways and many of the ways were never intended to be used. And he's talking about how the spiritual gifts are elevating people over each other and how this guy looks at that guy and goes, well, man, you're so spiritual and holy because of your spiritual giftings. And, and he's like, you're not supposed to compare yourselves to each other. You're all fitted together perfectly by God and you're all supposed to work in conjunction with each other and you're not supposed to look at each other and think, well, I don't need you. I've, I've got everything I need. And he's laying this all out beautifully. And then he gets to the end of this part of talking about spiritual gifts and he says this, he says, he says, but now let me show you a way of life that is the best of all. He says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all the knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but if I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and sacrificed my body, oh, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. That's huge. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and tongues and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Right now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, oh, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, it was time to put away childish things. Right now, we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But one day, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Powerful words that the, the writer uses to describe love. Powerful words that he uses to bring us to an understanding that compared to anything else, love is supreme. Everything else falls short. This description, and this is what I want you to hear tonight, for those of you that have put your trust in Christ, that have been filled with his Holy Spirit, that have the promise of eternal life, this description of love is where you are headed in your life, every single last one of you. This description of love is what God is developing in you. This description of love is the deposit that he has put inside of you that is being, beginning to grow and manifest. There's a very important reason that he talks about how when I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I acted like a child. But when I grew up, it was time to put childish things away. There is a line in this room right now, and I can put the children on one side and the ones who need to stop acting like children on the other side. Many of us in this room are at a place in our walk with God 
where when we see that description of love, we are right now feeling it. The power of the Holy Spirit tingling our guts, our insides going, yeah, this is for you tonight. Because you're no longer a child, but you are acting like you're a child. You've grown and it's no longer okay. It's time for you to put away the childish things, the childish choices, the childish behaviors, the things that you know you don't have to do anymore, but you keep doing because you just want to. God says, I have something else for you, but you've got to put those things away. What else does he have? Teleos, the maturing process, the next leg of the development, the process of growing and grabbing the place that God has for his kingdom, for you to begin to understand, for you to begin to walk out the things that you're hearing about, the things you're learning about. It's not always going to just be in one ear out the other. God's like, put this stuff to work. Put this stuff into action. He says in the book of James, he's like, don't be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Be somebody who hears it and says, how does this fit into my life? How can I put this into action tomorrow when I go to work? How can I put this into action when I need to meet the next person who drives me crazy and I've already written them off as somebody that I don't want in my space. They irritate me. I want you to remember these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love endures all things. Love never fails. I want you to think and rehearse and write out in your mind until you begin to grab a hold of the reality of what God is doing inside of you because this is what it looks like. This is the description. And it's not just about what God is doing in you. I want you to know something about the power that is in you. I want you to know something about the power of love that is inside of you. When Jesus said the Father pours out his rain and his sunlight on the just and the unjust alike, do you know what God is demonstrating for us that he wants you to understand? Is that God is giving away something that everybody needs. And you have love. And love is something that everybody needs. Why? Because everybody is afraid. And love is the fear killer. Love is the fear killer. When we give away love, it kills fear every single time we find that. Love kills fear every time we ex exemplify it in a relationship. Every time we give it to somebody, it's, it's, the, it's the opportunity to minister to them something that they need so desperately. When we come into a place like this, we can walk in and it happens all the time. We walk in and we're a mess. We've had a bad week. I've had a horrible week. And we come walking in here. Why is it that week after week we can come in and we can literally feel things inside of us shake, change and shift and move around. Why is it that we can come in here and walk out of here and feel like I didn't have a bad week. I don't even remember having a bad week. It's like everything changed because of what? Because of the love of God manifest in this place through his people. Because love kills fear. His perfect love expels fear. And if you're here tonight and you don't know any other way of life except for to be afraid, if you're here tonight and you've gotten so used to the anxiety and you've gotten so used to the worry and you've gotten so used to the panic and you've gotten so used to the what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, that your life feels like it can never change, I'm here to offer you something. I'm not here to offer you like a a magic pill or anything like that, but I'm offering you a relationship with God where he comes into your place where the fear resides and his love begins to take over. And you begin to learn in those moments of fear and panic how to invite his perfect love in. And when we begin to open the door to the presence of God and the peace of God, he shows up 100% of the time. And his perfect love comes in and fear and worry 
goes out. And when you begin to learn how to use the tools and how to learn how to walk with God and walk by his spirit, all of a sudden you begin to see your fears in a completely different way. They're an intruder on your peace. Fear is a temporary intruder in your space that needs to be expelled by the peace of God and by the love of God. And I'm here to offer that to every person that can hear me tonight. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how afraid you are. I don't care how worried about how things are going to turn out. I don't care about any of the circumstances because fear is an internal issue. And God wants to work inside of you in such a way to where you will begin to count on the love of God every moment, every problem, by situation, by situation, bringing God's love into that realm.